Well, take your copy of the church covenant, which sure has been sounding funny to me to say, rather than open your Bibles, but when you look into this church covenant, it does open us up to scripture in the Bible. It's a, you know, if we, if we can't look at this and go by it, how can we go by a sermon? <laughs> because this is a, this is quite a sermon here. I remember years ago teaching the church covenant to the teenagers and, and the impact that it had in such a good way to, to make us realize, you know, we're, we're accountable to the Lord and, and we're, to, we're in this together with one another by, by contract, if you will. Um, go with me to the fourth paragraph, and we're going to read the fourth paragraph, just one more message on the church covenant after this, and then we may move on to church history. So the fourth paragraph reads, We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and courtesy in speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. Well, in the first paragraph... We looked at several things. I know that we looked at the power by which we can keep this covenant by way of the Holy Spirit. And then in the second paragraph, we looked at our responsibility as a whole, as the church. And then we looked at our individual responsibilities as families who are families of the church. That was in the third paragraph. And now tonight, we're going to take a look at others, or one another, you could say. Pastor Stone has talked about a one another series that he preached years ago, and I have never got to hear that series yet. I would love to. But we have a mini-series in one another tonight within... This church covenant. We're looking at others tonight. We have of the church here a joy ministry. And I get Christmas cards and Shelly and I, I mean uh, uh, birthday cards and Shelly and I get anniversary cards from the joy ministry. That, that joy ministry is all about doing something for someone else. You know, that the Sunday school class I was saved in in church was called the joy class. And the teacher always emphasized by the, by the letters, J-O-Y, as an acrostic, Jesus first, others second, yourself last. If we have things in that order, we're going to have joy. And so we need to see others. In the beginning of this fourth paragraph, it says we further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love. Watch, watching over is, is, is looking out for one another. Um, to see another's need, even before they say it when that's possible. That's the kind of watching over that, that we're to do. We, we see their need before a need is even stated. Sometimes it has to be. Sometimes it's not known. But, but when we can see it before they say it, that's a good idea of watching over. Fellow members of the church, you know, in, in, in a time of need, uh, they're, they're not to be obstacles to avoid. They are opportunities to aid. Galatians 6.2, I use this verse at camp, uh, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We, we agree by this covenant 
to be the kind of church members that can be depended on. And, and we can lean on one another. We help one another to bear each other's load. That you can depend on members that they're going to be there. You can depend on members that, that, that you need them and, and you know you're going to the church house and, and they're going to be there. You can call them up and go to their house. You can talk to them anytime. They're going to be there for you. Not, not that we're to be focused on, on someone else being there. We need to be the kind of people who are there for the rest of the church. Within the same chapter, Galatians 6.10 says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. This contract that we are in, it is not contrary to the Scriptures. We are to look to help in the family of the church. We, we have all been helped by the church. We've been helped by one another in, in, in some way, maybe in several ways. And we never look for that to happen. We're not looking to do that, but we are looking to do good to another. And, and so in Romans chapter 15, the first two verses, it says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. When we only see ourselves, the church suffers. But when we see others, you know, then good's going to be done to the church. There's always the temptation to just look out for me, myself, and I, and mine. And, you know, the world does that, but, but we're to be looking out for the whole family together. You know, we're, we're a family here, the family of God. There, there, was, there was a very encouraging song at camp, and, and the scripture reference was made from 1 John in the song. And it started out talking about family. And, and the biblical reference that would be in that song would be about all of us as the family of God. And we're to see after one another and watch after one another's needs. We are under contract in this covenant, uh, which is in line with Bible commands to advance toward one another and to build another up. 1 Corinthians 14.26 says, Let all things be done unto edifying. You know, sometimes that's a real quick process with a kind building up word that you, you never know. You never know what someone's going through when they walk through that door. And it can be a quick process of a kind word to build up. Other times, it's a longer process, a, a detailed process that to get a person to a place where they can be built up. And ultimately, if that's not the goal, we're, we're messing up here. Let all things be done unto edifying. And we're to do this in brotherly love. We're to do this in the kind of love where if we suffer as a result of it, so be it. We're to do for others, and, and, and what, to do for others in brotherly love, it's going to, how do we know we're doing that? Well, it's going to be costing us something. It's going to be costing our time. It's going to inconvenience us in some way. And we're willing to do it, and we want to do that for the church. We're to see others and, and to meet their need and to help them when nothing is in it for self. Nothing comes out of it for self, but it's for their well-being for what they need. If we do not have a self-denying love that sacrifices, we don't have anything. 1 Corinthians 13 says, says, Without love, we are nothing. A good practice is for all of us to sit alone 
and look at these words that describe love. We call 1 Corinthians 13 the love chapter. And to look at those different descriptions of love and, and look upon ourselves to reflect on those things to make sure that, that in love we are seeing others. But not only seeing others, we move on in the paragraph and we're to supplicate for others to remember each other in prayer. In James chapter 5 and verse 15, it says, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We are to be in supplication one for another. We're to pray for one another. We're to supplicate for one another in each other's sickness knowing that the Lord hears our prayers and He moves on that prayer. We read of the effectual prayer, the the effectual fervent prayer of of the righteous. We, We live righteously for the glory of God, first of all, but when we live our lives as we should, God can use us in the lives of others. And we read right there, that He uses us in our time of prayer on behalf of one another, that that sickness might be healed, that it might be taken away. We, We have a long list that we go through on Wednesday nights. And, and I think it's a great thing to do to, to mention all of these names continually and be mindful to pray for one another. That's, that's what we're going to do. You know, there, there's something more to do than pray, but there's nothing we should do before praying. And prayer is going to be the best and most powerful thing that we do. Something that always happens in prayer for others. And I know you can attest to this by your own testimony. When we are praying for our brothers and sisters, it's hard not to be loving them. You know, those two are going to go together. When you have spent time in your prayer closet and you are burdened for a member of the family of God here, in one way, whatever the case may be, it, it may be their lifestyle, it may be their health, it may be many different things. It may be someone you see growing and, 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 and you're excited about what the possible calling might be on their lives and you are praying for them when they are on your heart and you're praying for them, you're going to be loving that person. There's no way to separate it, is what I'm sure most of us will say as a result of our own testimony of doing so. Not only will we love because of prayer, I mean, when we think about prayer, there's no limits to prayer. Think about our missionary list to take the list of those missionaries and to pray for them and know that you have prayed for people doing God's work all over this world. There is no limit to prayer. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. I was just thinking when, when we were just singing, Thank you, Lord. And if we're doing that with cleansed, prepared hearts for worship, and we are thinking of our gratefulness to the Lord, it's it's just amazing to think that that saved sinners that that have God's grace and mercy are pleasing Him in, in His house. 
when we, when we sing to Him, thank you, Lord. And if there are grateful hearts voicing and expressing that from within how He can be pleased. When we are a praying people for one another, that pleases God. It, it pleases our Lord. There were, there, the only other church I pastored, there was a lady named Betty Rhodes who attended on Sunday nights because her church did not have Sunday morning service. And she kept asking for prayer for her church because they were moving. And they were relocating the church. And they were going to relocate it, uh, you know, to where it would be a longer drive for her than, than what it was now. And, and, of course, I knew better than to be selfish. But I couldn't help but have the thought... I wonder if she might join here. And, you know, where I was pastoring. What a powerful addition Betty Rhodes would have been. And we're talking about a lady on a, on a fixed income in retirement. She had worked for the school district as a janitor. And she didn't teach any classes that I know of. And, and she wouldn't have run a vacation Bible school. But as I was praying for her uh, and, and thinking of her, I couldn't help but think what a powerful addition that would be to the church because Betty Rhodes is a prayer warrior. She kept up with our prayer list at the church I was pastoring more than some of our members did. And oh, how I really desired... That, that Betty would become a member of the church because of her prayer life. It was just evident. It just oozed out of her pores. You knew that she was a praying woman. We are all changed by prayer. And we protect the church by way of prayer. An amazing unity happens when we pray for one another. But we're not only to supplicate for others, we're to supply others. The, the paragraph continues with, to aid each other in sickness and distress. So we are first to pray, but we're not to pray only. People are always labeling those of the church as, as hypocrites. Somebody was invited to church and, uh, by a deacon and, and the fellow said, I don't want to go down there, there's too many hypocrites. And he said, oh, come on, one more won't matter. And, you know, the, I mean, there's some truth in that. We have a perfect Lord and, and we're not going, we are being perfected, we're being completed, but we're not going to be perfect until we get to heaven. But, but, you know, people use that word, people abuse that word, people don't know what that word means, people use it in the wrong way in judgment, you know, there, there's, a, there's an unrighteous judgment that we're not to be judging with, we're not to be judging by appearance only, uh, the Bible says, Jesus has told us, um, but the highest, that's probably the highest form of hypocrisy being this, that we would pray for someone and pray for their need without supplying their need if we're able to. As, as a church or as us individually, uh, that, that's probably the highest form of hypocrisy. James 1.27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And within that word visit, you find the meeting of needs that is to take place. And then in James chapter 2 and verses 15 and 16, it says, If a brother or sister be naked and des destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, 
what doth it profit? And then in 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's goods, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So when we walk out of the grocery store and we, we see the, the hungry person outside, we ought, we ought to first give them the life-saving gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But, but not to pray for them then that, that they would get food. We, we need to go back in the store and get some peanut butter and jelly and bread and to take it to them and do the same for for any church member. We're to supply others in this contract. But we're also, I'll call this portion, to search ourselves. It says to cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and courtesy in speech. I like that word, cultivate. Uh, you know, I've never been a farmer and I've tried my hand at gardening a little bit and I... I, th- I, think, I think I love the thought of gardening more than gardening. I tell you what, it, it takes some work. But, you know, I could picture different areas of town, but out 290, you can, you can drive out there at a certain time and you see the ground all brown, and, but, but the ground's busted up and, you know, the, the dirt's loosened up and it's just real pretty and flat. And then, and, and you see these, these rows, like, like you're going down the highway and it's almost at an angle from you and you pass a certain place and you see all these rows and then next thing you know you see some vegetations coming up and you see some food in those rows I tell you what that I know we have all kinds of tractors that do that for us we don't have you know a, a couple of uh, mules in the yoke or anything like that uh, today uh, for the most part but but it took some work before that food came up and sprouted up. There was a lot of hard work before the produce. Row after row, all of that produce, there was a lot of hard work in that. And for our spiritual lives, we are empowered by God. And then what He empowers us to do, it's to be practiced by us. And there's an action required from our lives. But there is preparation work to do with God before that producing of good, uh, good thoughts and good deeds towards our brothers and sisters can take place. You know, there is a resistance that is coming against us, so there must be an effort from us. Who knows that that old sin nature is always fighting against us. We're wise if we know that. We're wise if we can look in the mirror and see that we have an enemy coming at us every single day. We must know that. The old sin nature is is trying to get us to serve ourselves. So we must search ourselves and put work put hard work into our lives of searching ourselves with God that He might cultivate our hearts to be able to do work for Him, to truly exercise godliness. 1 Timothy 4, 7 says, Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Someone said, If I did half the good things I thought about doing, I'd be a really good person. If we will be as dedicated to the church, to our brothers and sisters in Christ, as we are to having the tendency of satisfying ourselves, we would be fulfilling our role with excellency under contract in membership to one another. And we would be contributing to the Lord, adding to the church daily. Think about us being a part of that. 
that we're able to do that, to serve others instead of self. I'll never forget my preacher friend, and I forget what storm it was after. It was way before Harvey. But he took, he had a lot of water, a lot of bottled water, and there were people in desperate need of bottled water. And he looked at all that he had, and he took a very small amount. And he went out on the highways to everyone who was stranded and trying to get out of town because of the storm. And, and he started handing out water. And he handed all that he took out real quick. And, and there's other people that are in need. They see his water. Please, can I have some? He didn't have any more. And, you know, he made a decision of how much to take and how much he thought he ought to keep for himself. And so he went and handed out that water and he went back home and he would just sat there sick at how much he kept and how much he gave. And what made matters worse, there were members of the church that called him up. Hey, pastor, I was, I, I've got, some, I got a hold of some water. Do you need any water? And call after call came in. He could have supplied others with all of that and he didn't do so. There, there's always that tendency to take care of self instead of... And don't get me wrong, there, there is our business that we do need to take care of, but we need to be taking care of one another too. We need to be searching ourselves. Cultivate Christian sympathy. A lot of work goes into that. Sympathy. There's a sermon I've been working on, and I haven't, I've never finished it, and I started it some years ago, and it's on one verse, and that is Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. How do we know that we've done that, that pre- preparing work in our lives, that we might truly have sympathy one for another, that we have been cultivating that in our lives. Do we rejoice over the successes and the prosperings of our brothers and sisters in Christ? Do we truly pray for their prospering and we rejoice with them and tell them what a blessing it is maybe whenever they have prospered, that that we would express some way that our heart is pleased over the blessings in their lives. And, and, And so that verse has been on my heart a long time. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. That's what a church family will do one to another who are cultivated, to cultivate Christian sympathy, to rejoice over the good in their lives. That takes cultivating because we're not naturally that way. That's not the way we are in the flesh. The old sin nature wants another's prosperity for ourselves. That's the way we'll naturally think. But when Christian sympathy is cultivated, we rejoice in the triumphs of others. Is God constantly doing that work in our heart? Not just to rejoice with them that rejoice, but within the church do we weep with them that weep. The remains of that old depraved nature will have us to say, well, I'm glad it's not me. Or even worse, well, oh, so-and-so had this or that happen to them. This is what they're going through. I wonder what they did. I wonder what they did that that happened to them. You know, there, there's a righteous judging that we're supposed to do. Judge not by appearance only, Jesus says, but judge righteous judgment. So, so when somebody says across the board, I'm not going to judge, well, that's, that's a detriment to the church when Jesus tells us to judge, but not to judge by appearance, not to judge superficially, not to judge on half the story, not to judge on, on a biased opinion, not to judge based on who we like, not to judge in such a way that there would be no reconciliation in the matter. 
but but we but we're we're called by Jesus to judge, but not that kind of judging. Not the kind of judging that Job's friends ended up doing. They were they were all right in the beginning when they were quiet and not saying anything. But then when they when they were trying to be friends and help, man, who wants friends like that? The, trying to come up with the reason. What man Job, you did something. There is something you did that caused this in your life. Wow. You know, I have never, after spanking my children, went and told someone else why I spanked them. If I tell anybody, I'm going to tell them. How much better is our Father that if we have a a trial as a result of something in our lives, He's not going to go tell someone else. If He tells anyone, it'll be us. And He might not even tell us. That, that must be, to speculate the case of another might be the very peak of the kind of judging that we're not to do. But what we are to do is to weep with them that weep. That's what's cultivated in the heart of the one who searches themselves. A true, sincere sympathy for another. But we not only see sympathy in this part of, uh, of ourselves being cultivated, we also see speech. Courtesy in speech. Man, there, there's a talk that'll tear up churches. I'm so glad Jason talked about what, what he shared Friday night. Because uh, and it, it would be great for all of us to watch that. There's a, there's a talk that'll tear up a church. I mean, the power of the tongue. There are so many warnings in the Bible on the tongue. I didn't say it Friday night, but, but the message that, that Brother Jason brought, that was, that was very similar to the second sermon I ever preached. And his was from James... Mine was mainly from Proverbs. You can go either place. You have a whole chapter of James. You have various scriptures that constantly come up through Proverbs of the wise man and the righteous and, and, and the wicked and what is done with the tongue, the speech, what we say. It's so important. The unfortunate act of a church member will hurt the church. And then the audible responses about it from others just in little talk at the water cooler, as people used to say, hurt, uh, hurts the church worse. A member under the control of the Holy Spirit is delightful to the church. But the member without control of the tongue is devastating to the spiritual well-being of the, ch- of the church family. On the other hand, good words, good nourishing words, do great things for the church. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 23 says, A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth. And a word spoken in due season, how good is it? Proverbs 25, 11. This was a vacation Bible school scripture memorization verse. It might still be. I was kicked out. I don't know. But Proverbs 25, 11 says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. The wisdom that comes with the way we use our tongue, the way we use our words, and what we say that helps, and to, and to stop the vain words that can only hurt. You know, we can paint the well whatever color we want on the outside, but the, but the true water is going to flow. So may our hearts be so cultivated that our speech 
be without murmur, but it be merry to the magnifying of our Lord and Savior. And, and I'm going to make a statement that I've made three times in the last month or two for, for whatever reason. It fit whatever we were talking about, and it fits tonight. Enduring a storm in silence is a great strength. It's, it's easy to, to let the vain words flow. It shouldn't be. We're going to give an account for every idle word. But, but it's just easy to happen. And it happens. And, and, and we become desensitized to it because it's so common with so many. It's easy to do. In, in weakness we can do that. But to stay silent, that, that takes a strength. That takes a spiritual strength. You know, when, when I flat see that, that I don't have words to help a situation at the moment, or, or for a while in something, or, or, or just discerning by God's help and the Holy Spirit that it's just to be a time and a season without words for a situation, I, I thank God for the teacher that He is to teach us these things to be wise with our words, and to be strong in silence when it's needed. I flat see my need and how we all have a need to search ourselves in sympathy and in speech that it would be cultivated in our lives. And now let's look at steering others. And we're going to close with the end of this paragraph. To be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. I've mentioned a little secret of mine before that I learned from someone wise, and that is, if possible, Take 24 hours before you respond to someone about a situation, whatever. It's going to make us respond much better over that time that we spend with the Lord. And, and, and what is so nice is when the situation is gone 24 hours later before you respond. Or it's not at all the way it was reported to you. It, that just flat wasn't the situation. It's so wise to wait, to be, what does it say? To be slow, to be slow, slow to take offense. It's amazing what will change in us when we take things slow. And as we go forward, in whatever situation to reconcile, that we do it biblically. Matthew eighteen fifteen, Jesus says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, I wonder how he's talking, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Verse 22, Jesus saith unto them, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. And that's an answer to, to 
Peter coming to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? And he says, till 70 times seven. Reconciliation is always the goal for the family of God, for, for our contract, for, for what we agree to. Reconciliation is always the goal. Everything must be done on both sides of an offense to nurture reconciliation. If we see that we are causing separation by our actions, we need to seek the Lord to change our actions. We are under binding contract in this biblical outline to bring the church together. If what we do creates the opposite, uh, the Lord's church is so precious, we need to stop and reevaluate our aim, our heart, and be steered toward reconciliation. Others. We have a whole paragraph in our covenant together about how we are toward others. We're to see others. We're to supplicate for others. We're to supply others. We're to search ourselves and we're to steer others. We're to, to steer all of us back into reconciliation with one another. The world divides and splits and stays opposite, and, and there are people who just don't care in the world, and in families and things like that. They'll just, they'll just cause everything to, to split up. Just in and of themselves it can happen. I could, I'm not going to entertain you with a story about a church and what started with one teenage girl. She must have been 14 or 15 years old. And, and all of the connections were made after the fact. And six families leave this church. And it all started with one teenage girl. And, uh, you know, the world does things that way, but the church shouldn't. We should always have a heart for reconciliation. Thank God that Jesus did, reconciling the world unto Himself. We, we shared a, a little sim simple definition of reconciliation at camp. How did, how did God reconcile to us to make a way for us? Well, it was two pieces of wood and three nails. He built a bridge, and it'll bring the entire world into His saving grace. And He did that while we were yet sinners. And if you're here tonight and, and you don't have that peace that, that you have taken the only way that you could take to be right with God, we, we pray that you would be reconciled to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, tonight. Maybe, maybe you've been caught up in religion and, you, and you're trying to do good to overcome what you know is in that flesh and, and what's going on in your life. Would you be reconciled to God the, the only way you can tonight through believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? By, by grace, through faith. He died for our sins. We've all broken God's law. You look at the Ten Commandments and thou shalt not lie. Revelation 21.8 talks about murderers and, and whoremongers, and I won't get into the definition of that sickness, but in that verse it says, liars shall all have their part in the lake of fire. And we've all done that. That's God's law. Thou shalt not lie. Everyone has. And there's a fine for sin, but Jesus paid that fine. We've all broken God's law. And Jesus paid that fine. Would you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior tonight if you never have? It's the only way to be reconciled with God. You know, why do I need to be reconciled with God? Well, it makes sense that the person needs to know they're, they're born an enemy of God, that our sin offends God. 
And because of His holiness, He can't accept us as we are. But He didn't leave it that way. He built a bridge through two pieces of wood and three nails. Would you come to the cross tonight and be saved? Would you trust Him as your Lord and Savior? We're going to go to the Lord in a word of prayer and have a time of invitation. And, and that's for the unsaved that you would be saved. But in thinking about us as the family of God and our commitment our obligation, our requirement to one another. May we, may we be ever so sensitive to that. It makes all the difference in the well-being or the poor spiritual health of a church. We all, every joint supplieth, Ephesians says. And so every single member of the church is very important in everything they do, in every action, we contribute one way or another. Thank God. Go back to that first paragraph. And we are all empowered to be able to carry out God's Word. We can be encouraged in that. That is, if we're in submission to the Holy Spirit, and we're not in rebellion to the Lord, but we're obedient to Him, we're going to be able to contribute in a great way to the church. Let us pray. Father, tonight we come before you and we thank you for an opportunity to to share these principles and then to dig in your word and to find them to be very good and tested by the word of God. And Lord, we see our obligation tonight and how we're to see others and how we're to supply others, to supplicate for others. Your commandments, so many of them have to do with how we are one to another to be be able to obey those commandments. And Lord, we're an undone people on our own. We need your help tonight. Lord, may your Holy Spirit be dwelling in our lives. We we know that you're with us. We know that the Spirit abides with us, but may he dwell in us. And may we submit to him. And may you have your way in our lives. Your precious church is worth the sacrifice of self. May we have a heart to do that. And Lord, for the one nearest hell who has told themselves they're saved, but it has never given them peace, we pray if there's one like that here today, that they would receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and know the forgiveness of sins and know they have a home in heaven. I thank you for the conviction that would be troubling their hearts even now if there's one here not saved. We pray you'd save them, Lord. And Lord, we invite you right now to interrupt our lives, to intervene in our lives, and to show us any way that we would be falling short of our obligation to others in the family of God. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.